praise God. And that's another way of telling the same story. The good old gospel ships, one way of saying it. That's another way of saying it. One day he's coming. One day we're going. Amen. You believe that, church? You still believe that? Have you stand with me tonight, if you will? And we're going to pray before we get into our lesson here. I really believe that the 45th chapter of Isaiah, which is where we're going to be, I really believe it's one of the most overlooked chapters in all of the Bible. And I hope to explain and show you how it is that way. But I really am asking the Lord to touch our hearts tonight through His Word. Because we need His touch. And we need His touch on Wednesday night the same way we need it on Sunday morning. And so would you help me pray that the Lord would open our hearts and minds to receive what the Spirit says to the church. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, as we prepare our hearts to open the Word of God tonight and study your Word, I pray that you will indeed prepare our hearts and our minds to be receptive to what you have for us. Your Word says that he that hath ear to hear Let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. We want to have those spiritual ears open and attuned to what you speak to us. Grant that, I pray, and may we leave in the strength and power of that word in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Let me just share uh, something with you before we get into the lesson tonight that you may have seen I tell you, promise you from time to time to keep you updated on current events, particularly, particularly current events that uh, speak to the morality of the day. We're not much into politics here at Cell Creek, but we do speak to the morality of the issues. And you may have seen this this week, I don't know, but it has happened this week or maybe last week, certainly was in the news this week, that in the state of Georgia, I don't know if you saw this, but... In the state of Georgia, and particularly in South Georgia, there have been 70 United Methodist churches all together at one time. 70 churches have left their denomination over the LGBT issue. They have left their denomination because they are a more conservative group and churches, and they do not agree uh, with the stance that the United Methodist Church has taken, uh, in general, overall, in uh, a kind of leniency or accepting, if you will, of the LGBT agenda. I say praise God for that. I'm thankful to hear that. But 70 of them left. But here's what's sad about it is that the United Methodist Church, rather than having some introspection and rather than saying, you know, we might be missing the mark here We might need to repent and turn back to God on this issue. They just pretty much wished them Godspeed. They pretty much said, you know, we have a mechanism for uh, churches that want to leave and want to depart. And these folks want to depart, so we wish you well. We hope everything goes good with you. You do what you do, and we'll do what we do. So there was zero introspection on their part, willingness to recognize what the Word of God has to say. Now... Now, that's not in secular America. That's in the church of America. And that's in one of the most notable denominations in America. So when I tell you that we all need God right now, the church needs God too. I was so thankful Sunday for the way the Lord moved in that Sunday morning service. What a great, great move of the Lord that we had on Pentecost Sunday I left here about a quarter to two Sunday, and there were probably still 20 people in the altar praying, worshiping. There were singers and musicians on the stage still going, and uh, it was a great, great service. I don't think I have ever in my life preached 50 minutes before Sunday, but I did Sunday. And uh, of course, I will also add that it was 5 to 12 before I ever got the pulpit Sunday. (laughs) But that's okay. It was a good service, wasn't it? Amen, and we're thankful for that. So let's go to the 45th chapter of Isaiah. 
I don't know if you've ever heard of a man named Cyrus or not, but there is a man that's going to be referred to here in this chapter. In fact, this entire chapter is about a man named Cyrus and what this man is going to do. Cyrus would become a great military leader. Cyrus would become really a world emperor leading a world empire called Persia. He was the founder of Persia. In case you're wondering, modern day Iran is the ancient Persia. Cyrus's own tomb, his grave, can be looked upon to this very day in the heart of Iran. Cyrus was a powerful man. He was a very smart man. And Cyrus and his army would take down the world's greatest empire called Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar and or Belshazzar and, and uh, Babylon. It's remarkable how he did that. And I want to share with you tonight as a part of this lesson how he did that. What is most remarkable about Cyrus And we're going to read these verses together. But what Isaiah has to say about this man comes 130 years before he was ever born. 150 years before he ever became the great leader that he became in the world and took down uh, Babylon. And yet with remarkable clarity and detail, Isaiah not only prophesies what he's going to do, Isaiah even calls his name 130 years before the man was ever born. Now Isaiah doesn't do that on his own. God revealed this to Isaiah. This was a prophecy that Isaiah gave. And so we come to this 45th chapter, beginning with verse 1. It says, Thus saith the Lord, to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron." And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. That thou mayest know that I the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel mine elect, I have called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Amen. Then when you, that's verse 6. When you drop down to verse 12, I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts have I commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He's talking about continuing to talk about Cyrus here. I have raised Cyrus up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall let go my captives, not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. The remainder of this chapter, and there are 25 verses in this chapter, the remainder of this chapter gives uh, more uh, prophecy concerning Cyrus and what he will do and how he will do it. When you go into the 46th chapter of Isaiah, 13 uh, verses long, that chapter is devoted to the destruction and the fall of Babylon. And we'll get into some of the details of that as we move forward here in the next couple of weeks. But let me give you, a, let me give you a, an overview of what we're going to be looking at here in this chapter. Let me give you an overview of what happened 150 years 
after Isaiah prophesied these words. The captivity of the people of God, of Judah, into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar had not yet happened. It had not taken place. And yet here is Isaiah up prophesying not about the captivity that's yet to come, but about when they're going to be released out of a captivity that has not yet come. Incredible, the mind and heart of God. Three or four generations would come and go, would live and die between the time of Isaiah and this Persian prince called Cyrus. He didn't know anything about Cyrus because Cyrus hadn't been born and wouldn't for quite some time. He didn't know what he would do in the world. And yet he foretold of the conqueror's career down to the most minute detail. I asked you a question, who told Isaiah this? Who told Isaiah what Isaiah could never have known a hundred and some years before this man was ever born? He's talking about a man he never saw or never heard of coming from a kingdom which did not exist at the time, achieving a conquest which then had not even been dreamed of. And yet he does it in the finest of detail. He names this future conqueror, and a hundred years later and beyond, he would show up. Babylon was considered, and it was, the world's greatest empire at that time when Cyrus would come on the scene. Babylon was considered impregnable. It could not be breached. Nobody could get into Babylon. Nobody could overthrow Nebuchadnezzar. Remember that head of gold that Daniel talked about? The greatest kingdom on earth? Nobody could overthrow this kingdom. The military science of the age pronounced that no method of assault or siege would work on Babylon. It would be such a great empire. And yet, it happened. And it happened in the most incredible way. It happened in silence and it happened in the night hours. And it happened because Cyrus was such an ingenious man. He had such a mind. He, in, he absolutely had incredible ingenuity and creativity. And Cyrus could do what no one ever believed was possible. What I just said isn't true. He didn't do it because he was ingenious. He didn't do it because he was creative. He didn't do it because he was all powerful and all that. He did it because the hand of God was upon him even when he didn't even know it was. God used Cyrus in a great, great way. On the very night that Cyrus would overtake Babylon, they were feasting and celebrating behind insurmountable walls. And so they weren't worried about anything The king at that time would never believe, even though there were preliminary reports given to him that they were under siege, he would never believe it until it was too late. How Cyrus did it in this remarkable strategy is a matter of factual history. He invented a novel way of marching into impregnable Babylon. He couldn't get over the walls because there were multiple walls. So if he couldn't get over the walls, well, he'd just go under the walls. And so here's what he did. He absolutely redirected the great Euphrates River. He dug, his army dug trenches around Babylon and redirected the waters of the Euphrates that went under those walls and into that city and split that city. 
And after he had diverted the water at night in silence, his army walked right into the bed of the river, right in to Babylon. Just walked in. But there's a problem now. They're not, it's not over yet. There were other things that had to be done. Because when they got in there, they were only in part of the way. There was another wall that protected Babylon after the first wall. And they had only gotten in part of the way. Herodotus, the great historian who wrote 70 years afterwards, says this. If the besieged, talking about Babylon, if they had been aware of the designs of Cyrus, they might have destroyed his troops. They had only to secure the folding gates leading into the river and to have manned the embankments on either side and they would have enclosed the Persians in a trap from which they could never have escaped. But as it happened, it happened that they were taken by surprise. They were taken by surprise because there were two main gates that had not been shut that were supposed to have been shut they had been left open like a, like a drunken security guard or a drunken uh, police officer or something might, might forget and leave open. They had left the gates open. Had they closed the gates, the Persians would never have been able to get into the city past the second wall and would have been sitting ducks from the Babylonians above. But as it was, the gates were left open. Seemed like I read something, seemed like we read something together about the gates being left open. In verse 1, the Lord says to open before him the two leaved gates. Isn't that amazing? 150 years before it ever happened, Isaiah prophesies his name and prophesies his victory over Babylon and tells exactly how they'll get into the city through two gates that were left open. And that's a matter of factual history. And Isaiah prophesied that in detail. Isn't that amazing? Verse 1, I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaved gates and the gates shall not be shut. And that's how they went in. Cyrus found them wide open. He found the way clear all the way to the very banquet hall where they were celebrating. And we are told that, he, that they could literally hear. Now, let me clarify something. Cyrus wasn't with them at this moment. We're told historically that he would show up 16 days later. This is his army. These are his captains. These are his fighting men that he would send in. He would show up sometime later to take control of the city. But it was Cyrus's army. It was Cyrus's war machine. And they got so close that they could literally hear the sound of the music in the banquet hall. And the Babylonians believing they could never be overtaken. You know, this, this, this idea of such detailed prophecy, his name shall be called Jesus. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He will be born in Bethlehem of Judea. These detailed prophecies that were given thousands of years earlier, it's incredible in the Word of God. And yet, I agree with Austin Phelps, doctor of divinity. He says, quote, There is no other argument for the truth of the Christian scriptures which unbelievers so generally agree to ignore as this. In other words, those who say, oh, I don't believe the Bible, I don't want to read the Bible, the Bible doesn't have anything to say to me, how do you argue? 
with these kinds of detailed prophecies that came to pass exactly as they were prophesied generations before and could never have been known outside of the hand of God and the wisdom of God. Amen. One other feature of this prophecy is that Isaiah explicitly foretells the restoration of Judah and Jerusalem, the rebuilding of Jerusalem, even the temple, through the agency of Cyrus. Cyrus will be the instrument God uses, this military leader, this this great man who comes in and overthrows Babylon, who does not know God and does not want to know God. God still uses him without him even knowing it. When you go to the previous chapter, the 44th chapter, and the very last verse of that 44th chapter, verse 28, it says, That saith Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. The Lord says, Cyrus don't know it, but he's going to be in my hand. Even though he doesn't know me, he's going to be in my hand. And I'm going to use him after he has overthrown Babylon, this nation that has come in and sacked Judah and taken my people captive for 70 years. I'm going to deliver them through this man Cyrus. And he's going to be the very one to give them the command, the ability to go back home and build their city and their temple back again he's my servant and he don't even know it that's the God you serve and that's the God that I serve amen chapter 45 verse 13 I have raised him up in righteousness and I will direct all his ways He shall build my city, and he shall let go my captives, not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. And I could go ahead and paraphrase and add to that, because I said so. God says, because I said so, he's going to do it. Amen. So when they became captives, what were the chances of them ever being let go And released by a world emperor, an empire who had them under his thumb, never was a prediction more improbable on its face than this prediction that Isaiah makes. And yet it came to pass exactly as he said. But you know what? When you look at it in the word of God, the conquest of Cyrus and the overtaking of Babylon... And the releasing of the children of Israel. In other words, him fulfilling the very will of God as God had spoken. is just a single sample of it happening so many ways and so many times in the word of God. Remember how the Bible also predicted the destruction of Moab, the fall of Tyre, the conquest of Eden, the doom of Damascus, the desolation of Idumea, the sack of Jerusalem, and yes, even the life and death and burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just another example of how God knows everything that's going to ever happen to anybody. And God has a plan and God has a purpose. And somewhere between prophecy and history, God works it all out. Amen. Brings it to pass. And let's hurry along here and look at a couple of verses. I, we won't have time to deal with a lot of these verses, but let's look at a verse, in verse 2 in this 45th chapter. I will, he's talking about Cyrus now. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. In other words, hey Cyrus, I'm going to kind of make this easy for you. All the difficult turns and all, I'm just going to get them out of the way. And you don't know it yet because you've not even been born. But when you're born, you're going to become a great leader and you're going to overthrow Babylon. And you don't know how you're going to overthrow Babylon, but I know how you're going to overthrow Babylon. I'm going to straighten out all the crooked paths and you're just going to walk right straight in and take over. 
And by the way, history records that when they came in and took over Babylon, that the inhabitants of Babylon were so glad to see them and so thrilled to have them that the inhabitants of Babylon embraced them. Isn't that amazing? Just like God said it would happen. But I want to mention this crooked places straight here in verse 2. I will make the crooked places straight. Let me say something to us that we need to remember in life. This is just a life lesson we could say. You and I have no choice but to go. We got to go. How we go is potentially the question. Will we go without God or will we go with God? But go we must. If you're born, I'm sorry, but you're as eternal as God himself. You've been brought into existence and you can never get out. And life moves on and life marches on. And today you have a birthday. And a few years later you have several more birthdays. And before you know it, there are wrinkles on the face. And you realize I'm getting down to the end. You're going to go whether you want to go or not. Are you going to go with God? Or are you going to go without God? Now, whether we go with God or without Him doesn't matter as far as this is concerned either way there's still going to be crooked places whether you go with God they're going to be crooked places whether you go without God they're going to be crooked places and to me this verse not only is a promise but it's also a warning that there are crooked places that we're all going to face there are crooked places in circumstances When we think we're proceeding along so satisfactorily, everything's working out, you'll come upon a knot and the rope that you can't get out. Difficulties of which you did not see coming. And no person can say of a certainty what the next hour is going to hold. No, Nobody, nobody here can. None of us. And so again... The question is, who are we going to go with in those kinds of times? The Lord says, not only does he say in verse 2, I will make the crooked places straight. He says, I will go before thee. I will go before thee. Man, I like that. I don't know about you, but I really need that. I really need to know when I'm going down some crooked paths, I need to know God's already been down this path. God's been here before me. I need to know when I'm facing some hard times in life, I need to be able to look down and say, oh, there's the Lord's footprint. He's already been down this road. I need to know that. And God promises Cyrus, I'm going before you and I'll be with you and I'll make the crooked places straight. And though he says that to Cyrus through the prophet Isaiah, he says that to every single believer who puts their trust in him. He's with us, church. He goes before us. And I'm so thankful that that divine promise is made to all because that, in that promise there is an expression of the difficulty on the human side of life. Our path gets difficult. Our path gets crooked. We can't see far down the road. We don't know what's ahead. We don't know what's around the next turn. We don't. We can't. But to have that promise that God's gone before me. And you know, the thing about the Lord is sometimes he's right with us holding us hand in hand, right? And we know he's right there. Other times we're traveling along through life's way and we look ahead and we see the Lord ahead of us and it gives us great confidence. Other times we look way out there in the, in, in the future of where we're headed and we don't see God at all. Don't you think for a moment when that happens that God's not there, you just take it this way. He's so far out in front of me, I can't see him right now, but he's already cleared the way far beyond what I can even see. Amen. Sometimes like a a good parent would go before their child 
learning how to walk, making sure the way is clear. The Lord does that. And if we could believe just that, then how calm, how quiet, how strong, how sublime would our life be if we could remember the Lord goes before us and the Lord makes crooked paths straight. Let's go to verse 5. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. I girded thee. In other words, I prepared thee. I, I raised you up for this time. I dressed you. I equipped you. I resourced you to be able to do what you're going to do for my purposes, even though you have not known me. Cyrus was known, by the way, historically. Cyrus was a great political man as well as he was a great military man. And when I say a great political man, I'm talking about to gain the the, the uh, favor of his, uh, of his people. We are told historically that when Cyrus would go in and when he would conquer a people, one of the things that he would immediately do is he would begin to take on the worship of their gods, of their idols, who, whoever they were, whatever they were. He would worship their false gods. And in doing so, he would kind of slowly turn the hearts of the people toward him to where they would like him because after all, he worshiped their gods too and that's kind of what we're alluding to here in verse 5 where the Lord says you don't know me but that's all right you're the pawn in my hand whether you know it or not amen now folks I don't have this in my notes but let me ask you do you believe that do you believe that do you believe that still Today? Do you believe that still today? Do you believe that Joe Biden could be a pawn in the hand of God? If Cyrus could be, why couldn't he? Donald Trump, Ronald Reagan, name whoever, name whoever you want to name. Could it be that Vladimir Putin? Could be a pawn in the hands of God? Could it be? I say it not only could be, I say in the sovereignty of God, in the providence of God, God has a purpose and God has a plan and it doesn't matter how unlikely it seems and it doesn't matter how much it seems that we are drifting away from the plan of God. The same way the children of Israel would have felt when they were taken captive into Babylon 70 years earlier, God knew what he was going to do. And he still does today. He knows what he's going to do. And he's going to bring his people out. Amen. Hallelujah. I just wish he'd hurry up and do it. <laughs> I think we all sometimes wish he'd hurry up and do it. Amen. Cyrus, and I'll hurry with this. Cyrus was a model of greatness. Because God guided him unseen unseen to Cyrus of God's own sovereign purpose to the nations at that time. And that's kind of what makes this story unique is God's always led people and guided people and, and had people follow him in his purpose and his plan. He led Abraham, he led Joseph, he led Moses, he led Samuel, he led the apostle Paul. He's always done it, but there's a difference here. They knew God. They heard God. They trusted God. And they walked hand in hand with God. In their consciousness, they knew they were being divinely guided for their work. But this passage makes a strong case that God has a definite life plan for every person. And sometimes when they don't even know it. Guiding Visibly or invisibly for some exact purpose that he has for them. And you know, that's a, that's a strain on our faith because we see this immense evil in our land. We see this immorality everywhere we turn. This society, this culture, we say we're going to hell in a handbasket. And it sure looks like we are. 
It sure looks like we are. And it can be a challenge to your faith to realize and recognize that God still governs the world in accordance to his pre-arranged purposes. And I stand before you tonight and tell you that he does. He does. And he can turn this nation and this world in a heartbeat. Well, why doesn't he do it, Brother Terry? Well, if I could answer that, if you could answer that, I'd be on a level with God. Right? The vessel of necessity would be larger than its contents. I'm a vessel. I can never contain the wisdom of God. God in his wisdom knows what he's doing and far be it from me finite person as I am to try to tell the infinite God what to do or how to do it. Amen. Amen. Look at nature itself. Every particle of matter, every force of nature has a purpose. It's used for the furtherance of a comprehensive divine plan, every bit of it. And if that's true of nature, then how much more should it, is it true and should we recognize that it's true of every one of us, of people? So we need to remember that God has thoughts concerning us. Remember that verse. And God has a place prepared for us to feel and a use for us to serve. Every one of us. Remember that sermon Sunday night? Dream again. Catch a vision again. Get on purpose again. Realize the plan God has for you again. And if you don't know it, seek it out until he shows it to you. He'll reveal it to you. And I want to close with these words. The preacher's homiletic commentary says this, and I quote. Talking about how God used Cyrus, even though Cyrus didn't know God and didn't really want to know God, but God used him anyway For his purposes, here's what this commentary says, quote, Then, no doubt, if a Chinese Mandarin pronounces a just sentence, or a Hindu pundit utters a true thought, or an African chief vindicates the rights of an oppressed tribe, the goodness of these men is an outcome of God's goodness to them. Let us take heart. There is more grace in the world than we know of. Amen. God's using an old scoundrel like Cyrus to fulfill his purpose. Stand with me if you will. Amen. And in chapter 44 and verse 28, God calls Cyrus my shepherd. He's my shepherd. He's going to lead my people out. And in in Jeremiah, the 43rd chapter, and the 10th verse, he refers to uh, Nebuchadnezzar as my servant. My servant. Praise God. So I'm telling you, it doesn't matter where they are, what office they hold, how much power they think they have. They're under the control of the sovereign God who has providential power power over all things, over all nations, over all kingdoms. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad that you know him and that he lives in us? Praise God. Let's thank him for his word tonight. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we're grateful tonight for this word, this encouraging word that reminds us that we're the safest place that we could ever be when we're in your hand because you are in charge. You are in control. And oh Lord, I thank you that even when it looks as if you aren't, the road turns and the road moves to bring us right back to your appointed design. May it be so for each and every one of us, I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may go.